hi and welcome to final talk in this fantastic series of lunchtime art lectures. Um, today Robert is going to talk about abstraction. If you have tuned in to Robert's previous talks, you will know that these lectures hope to raise money for the bursary in Robert's name. And in September, we will welcome the third beneficiary of this bursary to Latima. She is an extremely creative and talented artist. And so far, we have raised just over £1,500 from three, these three um, lectures. So thank you so much uh, for your support. Uh, every little gift really makes a difference. Um, as I said, after the lecture, there will be a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and send to all at any point uh, during the talk uh, and Robert can then cover that uh, later on. So on to today, we are really happy to have Robert back. He uh, is a former Latimer teacher, he's an art historian and a coach. And during Robert's 47 years at Latimer, he brought history to life for his students through a different lens to that offered by traditional textbooks. Uh, Robert used pictures and visual art to create discussion of the historical period. And luckily for us, he still does today. So Robert, on that note, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you. One of the obvious things about modernism is that it sees the development of abstract art the term abstraction is from the Latin to take away from, to take out of, and it's something that you come across automatically in philosophy where you make distinctions between uh, concrete words, which are words that describe physical things, as opposed to abstract ideas and words that convey abstract ideas, which are created by the human mind when they induct from the physical world into kind of more general principles of abstract ideas. Now the philosopher whose ideas, in my opinion, have the biggest influence on the development of abstraction in art is going to be Plato. And Plato famously wrote books about all different aspects of human existence. And he also had his own theory of creation. He produced a book that was entitled the Timaeus, which survived through the Middle Ages in Latin, was read in the Renaissance, and I'm going to claim has an influence right through to modern art. So if Tony, you can go to the full screen, we're going to consider what Plato's ideas were in the Timaeus. Uh, he was someone who wrote about the creation where he believed in a kind of general world soul or mind, and that world, soul, or mind created what exists in the universe. And Plato made a sharp distinction between form and matter. And matter was going to be the physical things that existed in the world. And basically for them, it was the four elements, fire, earth, air, and water. Whereas the thing that gives structure and significance and proportion and beauty and so on, to the things that exist in the physical world is when the divine mind adds form to them. And therefore in the Timaeus, what he did was to talk about what these divine forms were actually going to be. What you're seeing on the screen is a 17th century diagram by the astronomer Kepler. And what Kepler was doing was to write a book on the wonders of the cosmos. And this is his diagram of what he interpreted Plato as saying that the universe was based on. Because you have the physical matter, but then the forms that actually give beauty and significance to everything are going to be geometrical and mathematical. So he's looking at a circle, isn't he? Which is obviously going to be a symbol of completeness. Then he's also put inside the circle lines which create physical 3D objects. So you've definitely got a cube, haven't you? And then you can see that at the very center you have triangles and the triangles come together and create pyramids. Therefore, 
according to Plato, there is a mathematical, geometrical harmony and beauty to the things of the universe. And therefore, that is often what artists have actually tried to recreate. So you obviously know how, if you go to books on architectural theory, from Alberti to Bellagio, they talk about mathematical proportion and the relationship of geometrical shapes. And if you look at high Renaissance paintings like Leonardo and Raphael, you'll know how often the compositions of the paintings are based around, for example, uh, triangles or circles, and how these are supposed to add beauty to the uh, painting that you're producing. The most extraordinary example of this kind of thinking comes from a Genoese artist called Luca Cambiasso. And if you look at some of his preparatory drawings, this isn't the only one, there are others as well, produced in the late 16th century, you see he's done a kind of cubist analysis of these moving human figures, where if you look at the figures as a whole, they do actually have apparently these cubic geometrical forms which fit together in the movements of a human being. And therefore, in the Renaissance, there's a clear link between Plato's ideas and abstract forms in Renaissance art. But we're going to look at modernism and the main way in which these kind of ideas entered into modernism was through the influence of the occult. Uh, we're going to see how several artists became followers of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. And um, this is Madame Blavatsky looking suitably enigmatic and wise. And in the 80s, 80s and the 1890s, she created what was called the Theosophical Society. And this Theosophical Society was taking its name from sophistry, which is knowledge, and theos, which is God. And she wanted to produce a synthesis of all the great religions of the world. So she saw parallels between Christianity, pagan religions, and also Oriental religions. And she created a movement that had a very big appeal to the unorthodox in the late 19th century. She had her own theories about uh, creation. Uh, she was a dualist and she believed that the whole universe was based around two principles, male and female, and therefore came into existence in the same way as human reproduction. And in her book, she describes all the main kind of mystic symbols that express this. If you look at the uh, kind of emblem that she developed, which was for the lodge doors and put onto the Theosophical Society building in Gloucester Road, you can see what the emblems of Theosophy are about. You've got a Christian cross at the centre, but of course it's not a Christian cross. You can see how it is actually an Egyptian ankh, A-N-K-H, which was a nilometer and which was believed to contain the secret wisdom of the Egyptians. And then you can see how what she's done is to construct a kind of symbolic uh, geometry. Uh, the circle is a snake eating its tail, which is the symbol of eternity. Then you've got these two triangles placed upside down. And she believed that these triangles represented the two main forces in the universe. So the vertical triangle is for the male and the upturned triangle is for the female. And in the 19th century, they argued that the, she argued that the Christian cross was actually derived from this Egyptian Ankh and was basically a phallic symbol. And she interpreted the arms of the cross, the vertical as the male principle and the horizontal as the female principle. Her ideas were very widespread. There were lots of branches all over the world of the Theosophical Society. And several of the most significant abstract artists read her books and copied her ideas. A follower of hers called Charles Ledbetter produced a book called Thought Forms. And what he did in that was to produce reproductions of thought forms that he believed he had seen. Because taking up from Oriental ideas, uh, there were quite a lot of use of things like drugs and meditation in theosophy. And he believed that actually in your soul, you created various 
kind of forms which express different sorts of emotion. You can see this one is wild and turbulent for others that are mentally peaceful and therefore what you've got is the first ever example of what you might, you might have thought was an abstract painting. This is 1908 and he produced a book full of these illustrations which are basically abstract paintings and they were of interest to several of the um, new artists. If you consider the development of Piet Mondrian and you look at what was his famous tree series, you can see over a period of about four years how he starts with the tree at the top and then by the bottom of this sequence you're beginning to see what you think of as a typical Mondrian. So if you start at the top, the first picture is known as the red tree for obvious reasons and you can see how he is knowing about the art of um, people like Van Gogh because he's applying paint in the same expressionist kind of way and also he knew about the ideas of the foves that trees don't have to be the colours that you see and can be bright red. The next one is kind of simplified and you see how he's turning actually the branches of the tree into planes and this is because he had begun to hear about what was happening with Cubism. And then the next one is becoming an almost completely abstract version. You can hardly recognize there is a tree at all. And then you begin to get the ones that really confirm his new style. The next one shows you the tree, but it's taken on a much more abstract kind of quality. And if you think about it, it's not only got the organic shapes of the curves, but you see how the whole thing is dominated by a vertical that goes straight up the center and then a horizontal that goes straight across the middle. And at this time he wrote about how he'd been reading Theosophical Ideas and Led Better and how the verticals represented maleness and the horizontal represented the feminine which is directly taken from Madame Blavatsky's books. And then the last picture, you would not really know that this was a tree at all. And you're now getting very close, aren't you, to what by the 1920s will become the style of Mondrian that you actually know, which is a grid of verticals and horizontals. And he believed that the way in which the vertical and horizontal locked together was going to create a whole series of compositions. And you know that by the 1920s, the compositions have become really abstract, but they're actually based on the theosophical ideas of Madame Blavatsky and the male and female dualism of the universe. Another artist who read a lot about Madame Blavatsky was going to be Kandinsky. And if you look at Uber der Geistige, das Geistige in der Kunst, which translates as on the spiritual in art, you're seeing a book that he produced in 1909, which was very influential in lots of ways on the ways in which uh, modern artists developed their style. And his basic point was that he rejected the physical world and materialism. He wanted to return to the spiritual values of art. He copied Russian icon paintings. He listened to the ideas of the Munich cosmologists like, Diff, like Franz Marc did and he believed that what you should do is not have paintings which are bourgeois materialism which are representations of the physical world, the real world, the world of ordinary life and instead he wanted to get across spiritual states of mind. Therefore by about 1913 he's producing a very significant series which whose very titles tell you what is going on. This is Improvisation 6 from 1913 and think of what it means to have it called Improvisation 6. It is not a painting of anything. At this date even Picasso was still calling his Cubist paintings violins and wine bottles and things like that whereas this has got no subject it is simply an improvisation by which he meant a very spontaneous 
painting that came from your subconscious. But at the same time, he also produced bigger, more complex works, which were called compositions. And this is a composition, a large composition from 1913. And what you're seeing here is the way in which, again, you cannot make out representational forms. And instead, all you have is a combination of things that are from the art itself. He wrote about good vibrations. He believed in the way that the Theosophists did, that if you had actually the right combinations of colours and shapes, then what you were going to do was to actually communicate across and vibrate in the soul of the person who is viewing it and meditating about the picture in the art gallery. Therefore, by 1913, you have got, in my opinion, truly abstract art. And as you know, Kandinsky had been a friend of Franz Marc in the uh, Blue Rider group. And one of the last paintings that Marc ever produced was this. And this is no longer the rather nice animal pictures that Marc produced. This doesn't look as though it's necessarily got very much to do with sort of pantheism and the unity of animals and humans and nature together. And its very title is significant. It is entitled Combat of forms. And you can see that there is a combat of what he calls forms. And forms, I'm going to claim, are the actual basic language of abstract art. And I'm going to claim that in this painting you can see his use of space, his use of colour, his use of brushwork, and his use of line, where all these forms of abstract design are going to be the ways in which the art is actually going to communicate uh, to an audience. So we're going to go through and look at what are the abstract forms that are developed in modernism. First of all, consider space. Ever since the Renaissance, you'd had a tradition where art that imitated nature had learned tricks of linear perspective, whereby you could give the viewer an, an accurate representation of a building and a place. But in modernism, that kind of rendition of space is not what interests people. So what you've got here is Matisse at Collure in 1905, looking through a window into the harbour where they were staying. But look at how crap the windows and shutters actually are. Do you see how he hasn't bothered about the perspective. You've got lines that go into the distance, but they don't go to a single vanishing point. Therefore, he's completely given up and ignored traditional renditions of space because it isn't what interests him. What interests him is colour and pattern. And you can probably remember from last time how he talked about how he chose colours to express what he felt. And therefore, most people find a lot of these. Uh, Matisse paintings are very joyous and are very good at actually creating the idea of actually what the world is like and expressing the feelings you have about the world without bothering about perspective. But as well as actually ignoring traditional perspective and space, the artists in the modernist movement start to analyse the world in a new kind of way. Look at this painting from the 1880s, which is painted by Cezanne in Provence, and you can see it in the National Gallery. And when you start looking at it, it's an impressionist painting. It's painted quite freely. Uh, the colours reflect the kind of light that you're going to get off a rather dry, Provençal, hot summer. But obviously the most striking thing is that he's deliberately chosen to paint the rock formation by the roadside. And what he's done is to pick out what actually is the geometric structure that creates the landscape, because you have all these rocks that create planes and blocks. And then if you look at the hillside in the background, you've got here him painting the hillside in a very different way, a different way than tradition. Uh, he famously used a big 
square brush. And you can actually see how he's applied the paint with the brush quite heavily filled with paint and then dragged across the surface. And therefore, if you put on your paint like that, do you see how this hillside consists of a series of flat plains? And whereas real hillsides are mostly going to be rounded and curvaceous and gradually rise up in a curve on the hillside, what he does is to almost dissect this hillside like you would cut a diamond, so that it ends up as a series of facets where all the planes interlock. So if you go back to that whole view, you've got the planes of the rocks in the foreground, and then you have this almost abstract pattern of planes um, in the hillside. Now, Cezanne had been much ignored during his lifetime, but in 1905, 1906, 1907, there were various retrospectives for Cezanne, which had a big influence on the young artists around in Paris. So if you go to a painting by Georges Braque in 1908, which is at another Provençal village called Estarc, you can very clearly and obviously see the influence of Cezanne on Braque. The color palette is almost identical and what he's done is to take the village and his houses and he's reduced them hasn't he to pure geometrical forms so that the house is a cube and the house is a pyramid and then the trees are not rounded but they have lots of flattened surfaces and planes and it was this exhibition and this painting by Georges Braque that actually led the critic Vosel to write a review of the new exhibition which appeared in the Paris paper, where he talked about these artists being cubists. And therefore, you've got this new concept of what to do with space in cubism. And it's basically looking through the appearance of things and showing the basic geometry behind them. But it also does much more than that. If you look at a Picasso, like this portrait of his dealer, Ambrose Wallard, you can see that it fits in with what the cubists themselves at the time called analytical cubism. If you look at Monsieur Vallard's body, or if you look at the background in the room, you can see all this series of flat planes. And what this series of flat planes does is to actually analyze what is making up his body and the room, and then of course also his head. There are lots of things about that head that are very peculiar. It's peculiarly elongated, isn't it? And if you try looking at the nose, uh, you'll get um, kind of double vision. Because Picasso and the Cubists really did reject the traditional notion of what actually perspective and space should be about in a painting. And they didn't set out to paint what you saw, they set out to paint what you know. And the critic Reynal called this a form of conceptual art. Because we don't only live in a dimension of space. We exist both in dimensions of time and space. And therefore, traditional Renaissance perspective relied on one moment, me at this point, looking at this direction and seeing things in perspective in this way. Whereas in reality, what we do is to move through space in time, and what we actually see is things from all sorts of different angles. So if you were to look at his nose, you can just about make out what his nose looks like from front on, but then of course it's superimposed on it, is his nose from side on, because you could be looking from a different angle. And the reason why the head is so elongated is because you're looking at the eyes and the nose, mostly apparently from front on. But if he's sitting down and you were to stand above him and you were to look down, you'd see his big bald head, wouldn't you? And you see how Picasso has flattened it and brought it forward onto the picture plane and therefore gives you the view from front on, from above and from the side all at the same time. 
So this is nothing like Impressionism. It's not painting what you see or what your brain interprets as what you see. This painting is a record of what your mind knows, how it's seen things from all sorts of different angles and how you can put them together into this kind of what literally was called at the time the first conceptual art. So it's a completely different use and view of space. So in my opinion, the first of the forms of abstract art is going to be to do with space. Now we're going to come on to um, colour. Uh, if you look at this, which is the Mondrian red tree, we were talking about how this actually shows his knowledge of Fauvism. And one of the main qualities of Fauvism is that they didn't think that they had to choose colours by what the colour of a tree actually was, nor by what the colours appeared to be when you looked at it, as you saw it in your brain. And instead, what you should do is to paint according to how you feel. And therefore, this is A, a very wild tree in terms of its actual natural growth, but B, it is also distinctly a red tree such as never has actually existed in the physical world. But it may well be a very expressive painting because of the way not only that he's chosen the colours, but also the way in which he has painted it. And therefore another form of abstraction is the brushwork itself. You may remember when we looked at the Van Gogh cypresses, that you could look at them as swaying in the wind in a mistral, or you could look at Van Gogh's brushwork in that painting as the brushwork itself expressing his mental condition. In this one, there's no doubt whatsoever but that the choice of the colours and then the scratched out kind of brushwork that you can see in the foreground, the way in which the background is broken up and so on, the brushwork itself is again making the um, painting more and more expressive. So for colour and brushwork, are forms of abstract expression. I would argue that the greatest of the most enjoyable of the colorists in terms of abstraction is probably going to be Matisse. So if you look at the Matisse La Danse, which is uh, the version in the Hermitage, there's another version in MoMA in New York. But if you look at this, you can see how Matisse, uh, two or three years after going to Colure, has made the color almost abstract. Presumably it's a blue sky, presumably they're dancing in a green field, but these are simply large flat areas of brilliant colour. And then the figures themselves have this incredible redness to them, don't they? And presumably this is again linked into ideas of life force and blood and therefore is meant to actually imply life force in the sky, the grass, and then the figures. And you may remember that last time we actually saw the prototype of this in a much smaller painting called Bonheur de Vivre, Joy of Living. And therefore, it's presumably justifiable to interpret this painting as about the joy of life, because you have this kind of wild pagan dance, you have these beautiful, bright kind of colors, and then you have this continuous circle of movement of life in the way it's painted. But Matisse had another form of abstraction that he wrote about. Uh, he thought that often a lot of the skill in painting was how you use line. And he said that what he wanted to capture was essential line. So if you look at the figure on the far left and you are follow up from the ankle to the armpit, do you see how there is one continuous curve that goes all the way through the outline of the figure? And this is deliberately ignoring what you should do if you were doing an academic life drawing. An academic life drawing was supposed to represent in chalk or something like that, the body that was in front of you. And bodies have musculature inside them, they have weight and they have mass, and then they obviously have outline, but almost all human bodies are rounded or knobbly. They have 
places where bone and muscle bulges out. They have concavities between muscles. What they never have is this continuous line that goes from the ankle up to the armpit. So why does Matisse simplify and make abstract the line of the body? But isn't this what gives the painting its greatest force? If you follow up that line, it leads you round through the interlocking arms, round back to itself. And therefore, if this is bonheur de vivre, the bonheur de vivre is expressed not only through colour, but also through a central line, which captures the key movements that are most expressive in the human body. So line becomes very important in abstract art. You probably know how Picasso famously gave up doing light and shade and did fantastic, beautiful drawings, which are simply line drawings and outline. Uh, think of the way in which uh, David Hockney did drawings in the 1950s, which are again, simply outline the way in which Andy Warhol did them in the 1950s. So that uh, in draftsmanship, doing chiaroscuro, the light and shadow within the bulk of a body, gives way to the importance of some, and simplicity of a central line. But you can also see this in Kandinsky as well. If you move to the 1920s, Kandinsky was one of a group of artists who were employed by Walter Gropius at the Bauhaus, because the Bauhaus was a, a, a an academy of design, but, but Walter Gropius believed that the preliminary art course was needed so that actually all the students who were going to work in cloth and metals and wood or whatever knew about what the basic principles of art were. Therefore, this is a Bauhaus book produced by Kandinsky, punct, linear, and so on, point, line, and plane. And isn't this an exact copy of what we started with, where the platonic forms were going to be in the book of the Timaeus, all the lines that then created circles and created cubes and created triangles and created pyramids, point, line, and plane, putting all these things together. And you can see this on the cover where he's reduced it to simply these abstract shapes. And by the 1920s, this is the kind of way that he structured his paintings. This painting is called Diagonal. And when you look at it, uh, you can still see that it's a composition. Uh, it's not got any obvious figurative content, I don't think. It's less wild than what he was producing in 1913, because it's got more of this kind of abstract uh, geometry in it. And you can see that the geometry is an interplay between circles and diagonals. And inside the Bauhaus book, there's one particular drawing, which is called diagonal tension. And if you look at this, this is the kind of basis of what he said that the art should be doing. And you can see what the diagonal tension is. You've got one straight line going from left to right. And then you've got this serpentine line that goes from right to left. And you put these against each other and he calls it a diagonal tension. Why is it a diagonal tension? Because Madame Blavatsky had argued that straight lines are male and then these curvaceous serpentine lines of the other diagonal are female. And therefore, he would have had in the back of his mind how this is an abstract combination of different shapes. So the diagonal tension, one sort of diagonal compared to another sort of diagonal. But they're actually based on the human body and how the human body is conceived in your kind of unconscious mind. Therefore, when you look at this, you're looking at the way in which he actually came to create these kind of forms. The Bauhaus not only taught design and painting, but also theater and drama and dance. And the two photos on the left are of modern dance as practiced at the Bauhaus. The two drawings on the right are by Kandinsky. And now you can see what the actual basis is of the lines. Do you see how they are actually representing 
the limbs of the body, the body turning against itself, the body in tension. And just as you'd expect in ballet, the movements of a dancer to be very emotionally expressive. So he thought that also just these very basic, plain, simple lines could also be very emotionally expressive. And I think that that works particularly well in the bottom pair, where you've got this um, almost violent modern kind of dance, and then it transforms, doesn't it, into what Matisse would presumably have said were the essential lines. And these abstract lines have a tension between them. That's the word that he used. And the tension between them is because of our basic unconscious memories of shapes that are created by the human body. And therefore, this is how he thought that you could get good vibrations from his abstract paintings. Now, these are from the 1920s. And I've been claiming that modernism actually lasts and through maybe something like the 19, about 1960. Therefore, if you move to New York in the 1940s, you'll find that you get Jackson Pollock producing paintings like this. This is a large, typical Pollock painting from the late 40s that you can see in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and which is the kind of painting that put Pollock onto the cover of time with the question mark, is he the most important artist of our time? And this is very archetypal, isn't it? The style that you'd automatically and immediately recognize as being uh, Pollock. And what you have is this apparently wild display of colors and shapes that are created in a new and novel way. He stopped doing easel paintings that he'd been practicing for the previous 15 years or so. And he starts to put canvases on the floor. Then he has buckets of often almost household paint. And then he has sticks and not brushes. And he creates this painting layer upon layer by literally dripping or throwing paint onto the surface of the canvas. And this came to be known as action painting. So if Tony could now go to the little video clip, this is a video of him actually creating a painting in this kind of way. I think the thing to notice in this video is the way in which he is actually looking down at what he is doing. He makes these movements, doesn't he? And this process is not all that quick. He himself wrote about how, when he was creating this kind of painting, it was actually premeditated and deliberate. He is concentrating very hard on what he is actually doing. And mostly you hear of this kind of um, painting where you drip paint and you throw paint and so on. Mostly you hear of its origins as coming from surrealism and from uh, the theories of Breton where he talked about painting becoming pure psychic automatism where the automatic movements of your body from your unconscious express your, uh, your surreal unconscious self. But I'm going to argue that that is not really what Pollock is about. So if we can go to Summertime, which is the uh, famous Pollock that you can actually easily see any time you want in London, uh, this painting is on display most of the time, dates from 1948, and it is, I think, one of the best examples there is of watching what Pollock actually is doing. He is, if you go close up to it in the original, he is putting it on layer upon layer. Uh, he seems to have begun with the rather pale, almost grey that you can see in the background on the canvas. 
then is overlaid it with these strong black paints and then he has added in various places some yellow uh, some green and some brown therefore this was a very deliberately created conscious image where in my opinion he is actually thinking through how he composes this picture and if you start looking at particularly the black lines do you see how they have a kind of rhythm how they go up and down like musical notes on a stave and therefore what you can see is actually a painting where you have all these apparently random movements but the thing i enjoy when i meditate on a pollock is actually seeing how your eye is kept inside the painting you see there is literally a kind of white frame where he hasn't put any paint on at all around the edges and therefore you're meant to concentrate within this picture and to meditate upon it now this is very much in that tradition of the spiritual art where you're actually meditating on a painting which creates a kind of state of consciousness a state of mind that madame blavatsky would much have approved of but this is in my opinion the ultimate development of abstract expressionism because of what actually is the means of communication i think that action painting was actually a really good name for this painting because what you've got here is a painted record of the movements that pollock made 80 years ago when he was painting this painting and just as kandinsky was trying to capture body movements and their emotional impact in the lines that he drew equally when you start looking at the way in which the paint is actually put onto the painting you therefore get this image where the action itself of painting is recorded and therefore the very actions that he made the rhetoric of his movements is the thing that is actually communicating the emotions that he was feeling and therefore you have reached in my opinion the furthest development of abstract expressionism in modernism and at the time it became criticized along with rothko for going too far because of an ultimate paradox if you successfully use abstract forms to express yourself how do they communicate to anybody else the good vibrations kind of all the electronic waves that are supposed to come from a painting do not exist all we have is our own emotional and psychological reaction and it's very difficult to be specific about what exactly are the emotions that pollock is putting into his paintings and by the late 1950s his art and that of uh, rothko as well was being criticized for being up itself for being for an intellectual artistic snobbish elite where the paintings don't express anything to anybody apart from the person who actually created them and therefore you get the big reaction don't you which is the beginning of what i would call postmodernism where pop art deliberately goes away from all this kind of abstract form and expression and instead tries to get back into popular culture and show things of the everyday world that people experience therefore i think that this notion of of modernism lasts from i've claimed impressionism 1870 through to about 1960 and i think that there are certain things about it that are the main characteristics of uh, modernism first of all it uh, rejected the traditional role of painting where what paintings were due to, painters were due to do was to imitate nature and we saw in the first talk how impressionism no longer set out to paint what is actually there but to give an impression of what you see and what you see is only light reflections and light is only color and therefore your brain has to interpret all these light reflections coming from the outside world where you're painting your brain has to interpret them so you know what you're seeing but then your brain has to translate what you've understood as to what you're seeing into colors and brush strokes 
on a canvas. And therefore, you've moved from painting which claimed to be about the external world, and it's become much more personal, and you're painting what you can see. And obviously, in post-impressionism and expressionism, it becomes even more, ever more personal. And we've looked at the ways in which the artists actually try to express an enormous range of emotional responses to the world that they have, where you have gloomy expressionist paintings, joyous expressionist paintings, but basically the aim is to express the artist's feelings. And then today, we've seen how you move beyond traditional modes of expression into new abstract forms of expression. If you think of the early monk, where he paints the actual death of his sister, there is incredible emotional power and expression and sadness in looking at the dead face or the dying face of his sister. But that's representational expression. Whereas if you remember when we looked at the screen, you not only had the power of the figure of the screamer, of the, sorry, the listener to the screen, but you also had the abstract use of colour and line and brushwork in the background. And so today, what we've been able to do is to look at the ways in which there is a use of purely abstract forms in modern art, playing with space and what you feel about it, playing with brushwork, playing with colour, playing with line. And therefore, I think that the key components of what modernism were about was it became much more personally expressive and it found new abstract ways of being expressive. And that's why it's so enjoyable. So I'm very interested now to hear what your reactions might be to today or any of the other things that we've been discussing in these talks. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. I think we have a couple of questions in the, uh, in the chat. I don't know, Robert, D, do you wanna? Sure, sure. Um, it's just something you said earlier, Robert. Hello, good afternoon to you. Um, you mentioned, uh, can you consider, I was thinking, can we consider Ledbetter's representation as abstract if he's actually painting something that is supposed to have tangible reality for him? Uh, yes and no. Uh, they often used electrical analogies and therefore he might possibly have been thinking about a kind of electrical life force within him that was creating these images and they wanted to reconcile the occult and science together. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's right because uh, in order to have these thought forms, you had to actually meditate and follow the ideas of um, Buddhism. And in your meditation, you were supposed to actually transcend the body, get into an ecstasy, which is to stand outside yourself. And therefore, he would have claimed in his book that he was actually having what he called transcendental and astral experiences. He literally believed that he could voyage into the stars and meet uh, spirits and minds beyond this world, which mm -hmm. then created these thought forms. So mm -hmm. I don't think that he is actually representing something physical. He would have claimed that he was representing something that is purely spiritual, that exists in his soul. Okay, so we're talking about something that's not material, but that is real at some level, though. He believed it. He apparently uh, a lot of the theosophists had all sorts of seances and um, use of hypnotism and so on, use of drugs and so on, where mm -hmm. they actually had states of mind where they had what they believed were real experiences. Mm -hmm. Notoriously, when Madame Blavatsky did automatic writing, which appeared in a cupboard in the room overnight, uh, mm -hmm. later than no, that at the time, people were obviously very skeptical in fact, she'd just been writing things and then putting them in the cupboard for the fire the next morning. Oh, but they all believed it. Fair and enough. Lots of other people believed in it as well. I think that people like um, yep. uh, Mondrian and Kandinsky, certainly WDB Yates, uh, okay. definitely actually took it for real. But then the question arises uh, from the perspective of Oriental art, of the, the Tibetan tradition of painting the metaphysical reality. Uh, yes. Is that an uh, abstraction or is that a... Absolutely, uh, but she definitely believed in and used not only mantras, but also yantras, 
You know what I mean by yantra? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And that's purely yes. abstract mm -hmm. um, pattern, which is from Tibetan art and which is uh, for you to meditate on. So uh, yeah, there's definitely that kind of oriental influence on theosophical ideas and, mo and some modern abstract art. But my, my question is slightly the other way around. Would that kind of analysis then infer that Tibetan art and its representational methodologies are representing abstractions or metaphysical? Uh, yes, uh, there's a long tradition of uh, the spiritual in art, uh, spiritual art needing to be um, uh, abstract. Uh, think of the Muslim tradition. Uh, mm -hmm. They ban, don't they, figurative Good. representational, mm -hmm. and therefore the very lettering becomes the uh, abstract form of expression. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can see it in the Muslim tradition, and I would guess you can see it in the Buddhist tradition, mm -hmm. though very obviously not in the Hindu tradition. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. All right, thank you, Dylan. I think, um, Greg, did you want to ask something? Uh, actually, it's Leslie. We're on the same, uh, the same call. Um, yes, I was really struck looking at the Matisse uh, picture of dancers at how similar the composition and form and the fluidity of the figures of the fairies in uh, Blake's interpretation of Midsummer Night's Dream mm. in Oberon, uh, Titania, Pup and the fairies yes. from Midsummer Night's Dream. And I wondered if he was in any way, if, do we know whether he was in any way influenced by Blake? Because it was uh, just... I've never cross, come across right. any evidence to suggest that Matisse would have known anything about Blake. I don't think he's the kind of writer that Matisse was interested in. I think that the parallel is a very valid parallel. And I think that I would interpret it more in the sense of uh, you try and be a visionary artist. You try and express what you regard as the force of life, which would have meant one thing to um, Blake. Uh, and then a completely different, more physical thing to Matisse. And therefore, uh, the way in which the figures are parallel is, I think, more to do with the way in which those forms of human behavior and representing them can be to do with élan vital and life force. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's difficult to describe it if you haven't got the parallel pictures because... Yeah, but I, I'm sure I agree with you. The parallel is there, but I doubt if Matisse looked at Blake. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert? Yeah? Uh, could you just say a little bit, you, you mentioned just then Ilan Vital and Life Force. Would you yeah. mind just yeah. embellishing that? Uh, uh, embellish when I've done this course with you and we've looked at Matisse, I was very heavy on Bergson and yes. Ilan Vital. And yeah. Bergson was a writer from the north, but he was translated into French. And he was very popular in the early 20th century in Paris. And he had this notion of élan vital. And what he was doing was to accept the Darwinian notion of nature and life force and to turn it into what he believed was a kind of value system of what was going to be good against the material world. And I think you can see a direct parallel between Bergson and Long Vital and those Munich cosmologists that we were talking about last week, where they believed in a kind of uh, life force in the blood of animals and the sap of the trees and the blood of humans and so on. And therefore, I think it was a very general movement at the beginning of the 20th century, which looked at actually how you could base your morality on humanism and the life force within humans. And it was given a vast boost by science where the science showed how much of what is going on inside human beings is actually to do with electrical impulses. And therefore they're constantly using uh, in Ledbetter, in um, Bergson and in the Munich cosmologists, they're constantly using electrical analogies of this life force which was within us and I think a lot of these artists are trying to paint. Yeah, okay. And um, one more thing, if you don't mind. Um, both Kandinsky and Mondrian arrive at abstraction through a gradual process. They begin as figurative yep. art and gradually uh, um, arrive at this, this new discipline, as it were. Yes. Whereas, whereas Pollock seems to go from being, if you'll forgive me for saying so, a rather mediocre figurative yeah. painter to this highly original abstract painting yes. almost overnight. Was it like a kind of 
spiritual or religious conversion <laughs> or did he just did he just become aware of ideas from uh, Europe? Again, I don't I think that actually Pollock has a more interesting gestation than you've implied. Mm -hmm. There are some really bad Pollocks from the early 1930s, for example, a self-portrait that we once looked at. And he was a low quality figurative painter. But he was in New York in the 30s, where there were exhibitions <laughs> of surrealist art. Greenberg was just opening up MoMA, where they were now beginning to have on display lots of um, Picasso and Parisian Cubist kind of art. And I don't think that the early 1940s paintings by Pollock are actually insignificant achievements. Um, I think that the uh, kind of surreal paintings that he produced in the early 1940s, I think are as interesting and very expressive, and that there's therefore quite a gradual evolution okay. towards the purely abstract. And then you've got in New York in the 1940s, Mondrian has arrived, hasn't he? And yeah. he is producing purely abstract paintings. Uh, Kandinsky, I think, was still around. And you've got lots of these abstract artists who are thrown out of Europe by the Nazis in the war and come to America. And therefore, I don't think it was quite as sudden as you claimed. I think okay. if you look in the early 40s, you'll see how he actually developed. Right. I have a question, if if, if it's okay, Robert. It's yeah. um, something you mentioned about. Hang on, I'll put my video on. Something you mentioned about um, that that at, at a certain point, like Pollock and all those, that um, this level of abstraction just became too personal to be of meaning for other people, mm. and so we have reaction in terms of popular art, pop art, and stuff like that. But then you get postmodernism comes around. I mean, in terms of literature and, and its ideas there, which basically says actually everything is a text that is regenerated in every moment mm. with every person. So, yeah. sure, um, it, when we look at Pollock today in the 20, in 2020, we are recreating it for ourselves, uh, regardless of what Pollock's state of mind was. We have to reconstitute it and reinter. Mm. It still has a validity. I tried not to say that <laughs> I thought that they produced a dead end and only expressed them about themselves and not to others. What, right. I, the, what I think I said was that critics at the time yes. said that that was what they were doing and yes. therefore it encouraged the next generation on to turn away from it and into pop art. But I'm on your side. I think that uh, actually uh, the very abstract art of Pollock and Rothko is very expressive and that mm -hmm. the notions that it is only expressive for the artist creating it are completely wrong. And I get lots of pleasure out of looking and meditating on Pollock's and Rothko's. Mm, and I would say that it, psychologically, if they're expressing something so profound with themselves, there may be resonance with somebody else viewing that. It must, it may it trigger something. So the, 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 the difficulty is that your word resonance, that is rather like <laughs> the uh, Kandinsky Beach Boys, Good Vibrations, isn't it? Uh, I was trying in what I was doing to put it into a more humanist psychology because yeah. I kept linking, didn't I, uh, the abstract forms to probably the first experiences of your body as a baby. Yeah. So that movement is uh, uh, the thing by which a child, a baby, expresses itself. Mm -hmm. Then you have dance developed where it becomes more and more sophisticated kind of expression. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to show how the power of these abstract lines is they have these, bring out these unconscious memories <laughs> of your first childish infantile kind of emotions um, of uh, the body as a medium of expression. Mm -hmm. And how actually, again, you'd expect, wouldn't you, a baby to have instant and different reactions to different sorts of colors and shapes. Mm -hmm and also to textures. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think these abstract forms are embedded in our first physiological experiences. Mm -hmm. And then artists manage to sometimes find their way back to these uh, powerful life forces in their abstraction. Definitely, very primordial in a sense. <laughs> yes. Uh, another aspect of modernism never covered is primitivism. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you could link it to that. Thank you so much, Robert. Beautiful, in, in engaging, interesting, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.
um, very much. I think we're going to um, end it there, um, if that's okay. Um, and thank you so much, Robert, for giving us these three uh, History of Art lectures. They've been absolutely um, amazing and, and brilliant.